really fantastic to see such a turnout here. Um, my name is Michael Broxton. Uh, I work down at Stanford University. I'm a PhD student uh, working in the lab of Mark Lavoy. And uh, I'm actually a computer scientist, uh, kind of working in the world of neuroscience. Uh, I've been collaborating over the last couple of years with the Dysaroth Lab. And in particular, uh, Logan Grosnick, who should raise his hand in the back because I'm going to refer to him a couple times, has uh, been a collaborator, uh, the kind of the main collaborator of mine for many years, uh, almost five years in that in that lab. So, what I would like to talk with uh, you guys a little bit about today is a kind of combination of two things. One is uh, a new imaging technology that we've been developing at Stanford for a number of years. And it's very well suited to recording these kind of optical reporting uh, methods, these calcium indicators in the brain, because it's a 3D uh, microscopy. And uh, it allows you at very high frame rates to record uh, this kind of neural activity optically. And then very uh, quickly after developing this microscope, we kind of discovered that we had a ridiculous amount of data on our hands. And we started to develop a data pipeline um, using uh, a bunch of uh, open source tools, including Spark. And I'm going to talk about that data pipeline a, a little bit today, because we have kind of a diverse audience here. And I think it'll kind of help to get everyone on the same page of what these data pipelines are going to be looking like. Ours is one example. And I think you'll have uh, a number of different snapshots of what these pipelines will look like. But I think they have a lot of similarities. So uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, I'll just start by talking about the microscope. So just uh, a little bit of background. Um, these uh, calcium indicators, as they're called, are basically fluorescent molecules in neurons that are expressed through some genetic uh, tinkering of one type or another. And uh, they best, they're, they're only active when the neuron is firing, when, when calcium levels are high in the cell. And so they are fantastic optical reporters, and you can just read them out uh, with uh, fluorescence microscopy. In the standard fluorescence microscope, if you're looking at one of these neurons firing, if it's at the sort of native plane of focus of the microscope, it looks like a nice in-focus image. But of course, uh, if it's above or below that plane, it looks like an out-of-focus blur. And this should be very like, familiar to anyone who's played with a camera. It's the same phenomenon. It's just out of focus. Um, but it doesn't tell us a lot about where that neuron is in three-dimensional space. Um, a lot of that information gets lost when it's blurred out like that. So a light field microscope is actually a very simple uh, modification of a standard fluorescence microscope. You just take the sensor and push it back a little bit and interpose a microlens array. And a microlens array is this uh, little microfabricated optic, which has a bunch of these tiny little lenses. And uh, these lenses kind of redirect the light into this interesting pattern on the sensor. And the way that this works, uh, in essence, is that every position in the three-dimensional volume produces a slightly different but very unique and kind of distinctive pattern on the sensor. And it sort of encodes the position of that point uh, on the sensor in a way that allows us to computationally kind of reconstruct uh, where that point was and, and with fairly high accuracy. So. Um, there are a number of advantages to kind of recording the volume this way. One of them, and probably one of the most important ones, is that this is a synchronous imaging method, meaning that the entire three-dimensional volume is kind of captured at once in a single snapshot. And, uh, and uh, so you're, you're literally seeing all these different neurons at the same instant in time. Uh, another advantage of this method is that it's very high speed. It basically can go as fast as your camera can go, um, so up to 100 hertz or even higher if you have a high-speed camera. And it's really limited only by the available light uh, that you can afford to have coming out of your sample. And then finally, it's very light efficient. Pretty much all the photons that are coming out of the sample are landing on the sensor in a way that allows you to reconstruct them in a, in a useful sort of a way. And so the photo damage that is uh, happening to the sample is fairly low, because you can really turn down the light most of the way and still get fairly good 3D reconstructions up. Now, there is one catch. And that is that in order to have this ability to record things in three dimensions, you need to sacrifice some of your lateral resolution. So it doesn't have a resolution quite as high as a normal microscope. But in this particular application in neuroscience, that's actually kind of OK, because neurons are fairly large compared to the diffraction limit. And so you can still make them out just fine. So here's a, uh, an example of a light field reconstruction. Um, a light field image that you would record on the sensor isn't an image per se as you would kind of expect it to be. Um, if we were to zoom in to the image here on the left, this is kind of what the camera records of the scene. It's kind of a bunch of these little circles. Uh, and these are the images that are formed behind each little lenslet. Uh, it's kind of a mess. And you have to kind of uh, tease it apart with a, a process called deconvolution. 
uh, to produce a 3D volume, and that's what you see illustrated here on the right. And uh, this is a max projection in kind of the three different dimensions. You can see it from the top and from the two sides. And here's a video of this volume because, of course, we're actually recording uh, this volume over time. So this is a, an acute mouse slice, uh, basically living mouse tissue taken out of the brain and, and uh, kept alive while we image it. And uh, this is from the, the mouse hippocampus. And so these neurons are just kind of, they're still intact and they're firing together in a network, uh, but they've been taken out of the brain. Um, and uh, you can see this video is basically playing back in real time. And because of the high frame rate, you can see uh, a lot of detail in what the, the activity looks like. Now here's another example in a different model system. This is in a zebrafish. And uh, here you can see the zebrafish on the upper left. This is a living awake animal. Uh, it's been kind of stuck under the microscope in a piece of jello. And uh, it's inside of kind of a fish theater where it, where it has a video projection in front of its eyeballs and it's seeing a little dot moving back and forth. And whenever the dot moves over here, you can see its brain activity over on the other side. Here are its two uh, eyeballs, here and here. And that's its kind of the nose, and this is its, its brain. You can see almost its entire brain, except for some of its hindbrain. And uh, this recording, I believe, was made at 30 hertz. And so this is also playing back in real time. And when the dot moves over on the right side, you can see a representation of the dot on the left side, and vice versa. This is a retinotopic map. Uh, the neurons in this part of the brain, the optic tectum, will actually fire in, in a pattern which is laid out very much like the, uh, the visual field. So just uh, taking a step back, um, a typical kind of experiment that we would run at, let's say, 50 frames per second, which is a kind of a good rate for most of these calcium indicators, uh, let's say that you run this experiment for about 20 minutes, you would actually collect 60,000 images. And if you were to uh, reconstruct each of these images, uh, it's a fairly expensive algorithm. Deconvolution is, is complicated and expensive. It runs on a GPU. It takes about two minutes per volume to reconstruct. So if you kind of do the math, that means that this would take, uh, this entire time series would take 2,000 machine hours, or, which is basically 80, 84 days or so, like if you had just one GPU. So it's a lot of computation. And on top of that, uh, if you kind of figure out how much space you would need to store the result, you would find that you need about half a terabyte um, just to store this one experiment. And on any given day, we probably collect about 20 of these types of experiments. So you can imagine how this kind of adds up very quickly. Now, what we do to make this kind of more tractable and uh, useful operationally is we, we parallelize this on, on Amazon Web Services using their GPU instances. And uh, this, when it's parallelized across 300 different machines, uh, only takes three to six hours. And uh, when you bid on these kind of spot instances, which are kind of a very cheap way to get compute uh, out of the, the cloud, it only costs about $100 to $200 per time series to, to deconvolve. So it's a, it's a cost you have to factor into what you're doing, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, prohibitive. Yeah. So at this stage of our processing pipeline, uh, this is not using Spark. This is using kind of a custom system that was developed by actually Aaron, who's right behind you, and, uh, and uh, myself and Logan and, and Ted Scharf, who may or may not be here. So uh, a fun side fact is that this GPU cluster actually uh, has kind of a peak capacity of 686 teraflops, which back in 2007 would have been the number one supercomputer in the world on the top 500 supercomputer list. So these are, this, is a very large, uh, this is a very large problem, very much needing the cloud. So the 3D reconstruction is actually just the first stage in a much uh, kind of longer process that we, we use to kind of understand what's going on in this data. Because once you have volumes, of course, you want to actually do something with them. So one of the first things you want to do is uh, do some motion correction. Um, we do experiments in living animals. Like this is, an, for example, a mouse running on a ball, uh, similar to what uh, you just saw a short time ago. Um, when the animal is moving, of course, its brain is moving, and, and uh, there are motion artifacts in the data. And on the left, you can see that the, the neurons are blinking, but they're also kind of jiggling back and forth. And you really need to correct this, because you can conflate motion artifacts with actual calcium signals, and then you don't really know what you're doing when you're looking at the time series. So uh, because light field microscopy is a synchronous imaging method, there's no need to worry about um, whether or not the top and the bottom of the volume are 
are happening are being recorded at the same time as with some other other methods, and it uh, is very it's fairly straightforward to just apply a motion correction, uh, which makes the volume like perfectly rigid. So that's an important pre-processing step. Uh, and then you kind of get onto some analysis. One of the first things you can do is to look at all of the time series for all the voxels in the volume. And there are admittedly a lot of them. There's 2.5 million voxels, and each of those has a 60,000 element time series. Um, so this is where we start to use Spark, for sure. Um, and pretty much everything I'll talk about from here on out is using Spark. So one of the first things that you find that you need to do is you need to try and change how the data is distributed across the cluster. Because up to this point, we've been working mostly with volumes. And you can kind of shard across different, like different volumes can go to different CPUs. Uh, now we're going to be working with time series. We want to kind of keep the time series local. So you have to transpose this data and kind of shuffle it around. And uh, once you've done this, you have access to a ton of time series data. So what can you do with that? You can uh, do some simple filtering, which might be good for pre-processing. You can detrend the data, remove calcium uh, bleaching effects, and things like that. Uh, you could do univariate regressions, which is very useful for uh, if you have a behavioral signal or uh, uh, an, like an input or output of your kind of the neural system. You can, you can try to regress against that and find areas of the brain that are relating to that signal one way or the other. Uh, you can screen or score. You can look for voxels that have interesting statistics, like very high variance or maybe like very sparse occasional spikes and things like that. And that's a good way to find neurons. Um, or you can go like full on and go do unsupervised learning and try to find uh, regions entirely like clumps of neurons or clumps of voxels, really, at this stage, which are somehow firing together and related to each other. And this, this tends to turn up a lot of interesting anatomy that you might not have known was related. Uh, uh, so basically, these types of methods, they tend to lend themselves very well to unstructured exploration of the data. And uh, they're, they're fantastic data mining methods. They're really good for just kind of figuring out what is going on in the brain when you don't uh, necessarily know. Uh, you're kind of looking for new stuff. So there's another approach, uh, which is also uh, very interesting. And uh, we've been exploring a little bit. Um, and this is to basically try to reduce the problem uh, somewhat first. And you, you start with 2.5 million voxels. And really, you know that there's about 1,000 neurons in that volume. And all you really care about are 1,000 time series that correspond to those neurons. And so if you can find those neurons and extract their time series, that would be great. Because then you've done this huge dimensionality reduction from 2.5 million down to 1,000. And you can then go forward from there and do somewhat more complicated analysis on that 1,000 time series that kind of really correspond to the neurons. So if you do this, um, one thing that you have to do is uh, this kind of matrix factorization that you have to do to find these neurons involves both kind of space and time at the same time. So you have to kind of reshuffle the data again so that space and time are both clustered on the same node. And once you do this, you pull out uh, sources, which are time series. And then maybe there's spatial support. So here we're illustrating some of these uh, sources that we've pulled out of that mouse volume. And then you kind of get to what is perhaps the biggest challenge, which is to use these time series and try to model the kind of this weird nonlinear state space that is the brain, uh, or a particular circuit in the brain. And if you do this correctly, you should be able to predict uh, the pattern of activity that you might be able to see in the brain. And that would be truly beginning to understand kind of how this cir cir circuit is functioning. How do these 1,000 neurons interact with each other? So here, once again, we kind of explode from 1,000 sources back up to like a million sources right away because we start looking at a lot of pairwise comparisons of time series. And you can also go beyond that if you're doing autoregressive studies of like time lags or nonlinearities. Uh, you know, this problem gets very big. So once again, we find ourselves using Spark. And in general, this, this problem of trying to fit a, some sort of graph model to, to the brain is a very hard one, because the, the graphs are combinatorial in the number of nodes. They get very big very quickly. So this is absolutely the kind of problem that you have to use uh, Spark for. So that's pretty much uh, all I've got today. But I would like to just take a moment to acknowledge, in particular, uh, Logan and Ben and Aaron's work, uh, on, and Ted as well, on this uh, pipeline. Uh, they have all contributed huge uh, pieces uh, to this pipeline. This is really the byproduct of a lot of people's work. And I would also like to thank all these people who write this incredible open source software that we can build these types of really complicated data processing pipelines with. So uh, our thanks go out to you guys as well. 
So that's, uh, that's basically it for me. Uh, feel free to contact me or check out our website. Um, we, uh, I would like to definitely thank uh, the people at Stanford that I work with, uh, including our PIs, uh, Mark and Carl, who support this work. And uh, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of light field microscopy, there are a number of papers that really delve into the method and provide kind of a blueprint for how to, how to use it and how, the, how to implement uh, the algorithms and things like that. So thank you guys very much.